John. I just want to thank uh, all of you for inviting me here. My name is Judith Ray, and I work with John at the firm OKT. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training, and I am also um, I also have a background in a, a master's in social work and working with children and youth. And I feel very passionately about the issue of education and uh, other social issues facing First Nations communities. So thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you to uh, Elder Frieda McDonald for your opening prayer and for the smudge. And uh, thank you, Regional Chief uh, Beardy and uh, Grand Chief Peters for the opening comments. And thanks, uh, Julia, for coordinating us. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. And um, as John uh, said, he John's role, of course, is to you know talk a bit about the big picture. My role today is I'm going to talk about the little picture. So I've got the magnifying glass there. And uh, John, you know, John's put the bill into context. You know, what's um, what's the legal context there between federal power under 9124? You know, where that kind of Indian Act-based power, a power over you, and your powers, your jurisdiction and rights, which are now enshrined in Section 35. Uh, and of course, our finding is that the Act, you know, you're in this middle ground, right? And John talked about that, that kind of middle time where you've experienced that very intense federal power over you in the past. You know, you've experienced particularly in education that history of the federal government using education, controlling it, using it for assimilation, and the harm that, the deep, deep harm that that's caused. And uh, it's important, and I, I think John's very right to recall, it, it, you do, I do have this feeling reading some of the things in the media that there's many people out there that never understood that or really never internalized that, many non-First Nation Canadians, or have very quickly forgotten it and seem very willing to accept what the federal government is saying about this bill and very willing to trust um, what it's trying to propose. And of course, you have a very different experience from that. So you're in this middle position now. You have done a lot with your education systems. You have grown your control, particularly since the you know 70s, roughly. And um, you know you have developed schools on reserve. You have developed education systems and supports. You have worked with uh, some provincial schools locally, and uh, have been developing agreements and so on. Um, you have you aren't really the Indian Act provisions are not governing your education systems right now, almost you know, with very rare exceptions. Uh, you don't have funding, though. You don't have very good funding at all. The funding is abysmal. And um, that, that really compromises what you can do uh, with the education systems you're developing. And you don't have that full recognition of your jurisdiction, and that does compromise and limit your control. But you do have that vision, right? You do have that vision of the rights you're moving towards. And it's that vision, and it was shown in those slides about the 1972 and 2010 policies, of a vision that it's not just Western and it's not just traditional. It's a vision that allows your children to be strong in both worlds. And I think that's very important. And I don't think other people understand that vision or could implement it. I think you're the ones, they're the only ones who really understand that vision and could implement it for your children. So with that context, my job is to look into the act. Um, how, how does it uh, decrease your control, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of it, and how does it increase federal control? And I've spent some time, uh, you know, looking at these provisions and thinking about them and, and uh, trying to think about uh, what this means for you. The act, of course, suggests in its title that it's um, giving you control, right? That's what, the, that's what the title suggests, First Nations Control of First Nation Education Act. It is very clear to me, looking at the act, that that is an illusion. That is not what the act is doing. It is not recognizing your rights or jurisdiction in any way. But even in a delegated sense, it is not in any practical way increasing your control. 
the things that it references that you may do or that it, quote, enables you to do, to use the word that is at least once used, you know, at one point used in the act, those are things you are already doing. Those are things you already can do and do, in fact, do. And it's going to take those things and impose a whole bunch of federal limits and constraints on those powers that you already exercise. So it is not giving you any new powers or, you know, even in a delegated sense, saying, yeah, go ahead and do something new. It's saying, yeah, go ahead and do these things, which you already do. And then it's imposing a whole bunch of new regulations on top of those things that are going to be controlled through federal legislation, federal rules, and discretion of the federal minister. So that's very much giving you less control than what you have now. And you can see this uh, very vividly if you take a close look at Section 3. Section 3 is the first, what I would call, substantive provision of the Act. So it starts with a preamble, as I do. I'll come back to that. It has definitions. It has a, a short title. You were just give the name of the act. That's all very standard. And then it starts with section three, where it says the purpose of this act is to provide for control by First Nations of their education system, currently, by enabling, so it says, councils of First Nations to do three things. To administer schools situated on reserves. We well, already certainly do that to delegate that power to First Nations education authorities. Well, you already do that. You can delegate powers as you wish to various education authorities, which a number of you already do. Or to enter into tuition or administration agreements. Well, you already do that. You enter into agreements for tuition. They have this other term in this act, administration is not terribly important. Um, and all of that in accordance with this act. So that's new. Because it means that these things you already do, you're now going to have to do in accordance with this act. What's actually happening in this act is a shift in control away from you and towards Indian affairs. And it does that in three ways. So there's three, three ways that this act uh, really clearly increases federal control and decreases your control. The first is by imposing a set of federal rules. And a number of those are laid out in the act. You're going to see more of them developed, or you would see more of them, were this act to continue. You would see more of them developed in the regulations. Those will be federal regulations. As with the Act, you know, the, the federal government may say it's consulted people about that, but then it's going to make a decision and pass a set of regulations, and those would be the regulations. You, after that, you could probably expect federal policies, other policies that, you know, Indian Affairs to come out, ANSI policies and so on. So there'll be a whole number, and we know a bunch of them in the Act, or we can get a sense in the Act where it lists what is going to follow, and we'll see more of the rules. But there's a number of rules that are uh, going to be developed under this act and have been already under the, the, what's there already that are federal rules that are getting imposed onto your education system. So the, the way I've kind of uh, characterized that is basically the department says jump and you're supposed to say how high, right? They're saying this is what you have to do and you're supposed to say absolutely, yes sir, you know exactly what is the measure that we're supposed to meet. So instead of you setting the rules, they're setting the rules. And those are going to be an interference, of course, with the rules that you may already have. So we'll come back to that. The second thing they're doing is they're backing up those rules with enforcement. So, and that, we'll come back to these each of these three points, but that enforcement is quite rigorous, up to and including a third-party management regime in education. And you know, you're, you be, you're familiar with their third-party management type of regime. This one is slightly different, but it's, it, it's applied directly to education. So what you've experienced is in the financial realm, this would be you know, a third-party manager that controls your finances. You know, the financial realm is where you would have a third-party manager controlling finances. This would be a third-party manager. They haven't used that word. They've called it a temporary administrator who would actually control your education, who would take over a school. So if you say no, 
you don't follow the rules, then ANSI's saying, okay, then we'll take over your school. That's backed up. And the third thing that it's doing is it's inserting ministerial discretion into a whole number of decisions. And I'll come back to what that means, but it, it just gives the minister and the department a wide latitude and flexible power that they can exercise to make their choices about how things should go. So you say, why is that the case? And they say, because we said so. <laughs> it's how it characterized that. It gives them the right to say that because we decided it. That's what we decided. So they say jump. About what? What, are, what kinds of rules would they be setting about your education system? So I've just run through a number. If you, in the um, written memo that you have in your packages, you can turn to it later as a reference. I don't recommend that you necessarily comb through it all right now. Um, but this is just giving you a sense. There's, there's a lot of rules suggested here. And again, on a lot of these questions, we don't have all the details at this point, but the act is setting up a framework that's going to allow, you know, it's giving you a sense of what the federal rules are going to be about, and then you're going to expect more to come in the regulations and the policies and so on. So there's lots of subjects here covered, very substantive questions going right into the content and the real internal governance of your education system. Who are your students? What teachers you can hire and their qualifications? What are your educational programs, your curriculum and so on? your language and culture program, including whether such a program, your language and culture programs qualify as an immersion program, or whether it's merely a program of study, a more minor thing, it seems to me, from the, what the rules that the language is using. Um, what kinds of things you should, must track, what you must plan for, set as objectives, work towards to improve, you have to do these school success plans. Federal government's going to tell you what those are, apparently, and you don't know yet. Many reports, that's just one of them, of the school success plan, also a school safety plan, annual report, annual budget, and any other report required by the regulations, whatever they may decide. Um, it lays out what information must be public, what must be, you know, what you might be able to decide to keep private. Rules about your management of human resources, financial information technology, properties, and whatever else it decides to add on. How and when your community members give input. Your special, I don't want to see. Uh, click outside. Your special education programs, who your director of education is, what his or her mandate is, who your principal is, and what his or her mandate is your policies, your procedures, your insurance, the school calendar, instructional days and hours, what kinds of things you can delegate and whether that delegation is approved, your tuition agreements and whether those tuition agreements are approved, um, other agreements that you may have with other entities about school administration and whether those are acceptable to the minister, and um, what kind of inspector you must hire to ensure you are complying with all of these rules. That gives, uh, I think, everyone a pretty good idea um, about the scope, at least, of uh, topics that the federal government has decided to regulate using its power over Indians in Section 9124 to get right into your education systems um, at a federal level. If you're not complying with those federal rules, the federal enforcement system would kick in. And there's four types of enforcement laid out in the act. Um, everyone would be required to hire a school inspector who meets the qualifications set out in the act. That school inspector does inspections according to the manner and so on set out in the act and completes reports according to the, what's set out in the act. If the school inspector identifies things that you've done wrong, uh, that are not in compliance in your education system, they could identify remedial measures that you must take, and the act requires you to uh, take those measures. The second thing is that the minister could force you to hire a special advisor, and 
We don't know a lot of details about that yet. It, to me, it sounds similar. It just reminds me of a kind of co-manager kind of concept. Um, but the minister here is saying, uh, you know, I know best and you don't, and you clearly don't know how to run your school system, and I think you should get advice, and this is the kind of person I think you should get advice from, and you need to hire them and work with them. Uh, if, if that is insufficient, uh, according to the minister, the minister can appoint a temporary administer, administrator. And that, uh, that person then takes over the school. That person then has control over the school and the education operations of your first station. And your staff and so on, the education staff, are required to uh, cooperate with that person, provide that person information, and follow their directions and so on. Um, that is, of course, new. And as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's obviously different here is that it's coming directly into your program. It's at a program level here, where you would see that administrator uh, take control. Um, and the fourth thing the minister can do is revoke a designation of your education authority. If you've designated you know, powers to another body to do certain things in your education system, that could be revoked. And there's no, um, I mean, as with the other third party type of, you know, enforcement and third party management systems we've seen in Indian Affairs Implement, there's no accountability there. There's wide discretion, there's not any uh, standards for this really set out in the act. It's just if the minister decides that that would be best for you, uh, then the minister can do that. And um, it's uh, not, there's no way provided in the act under which you could challenge that. You could probably go outside the act, bring a judicial review as people occasionally do for third party management and so on. It's of course very difficult, um, particularly given that there's no standards in terms that is so discretionary. Um, uh, and uh, no, you know, no due process set out here, no hearing, appeal, or anything like that. The third thing is the because I said so, and you know, we've touched on it because it's, it's already come up throughout these things, but kind of peppered throughout the act, you know, here, there, everywhere, are all of these places where the minister just has discretion. What that means is that it's a place where it's, you'll see it in the act when it says things like the minister may. So if you look for words like the minister may, or if in the minister's opinion, or you know, if the minister decides, I think there's another word, it's mentioned in my memo, there's another phrase used like that. Um, but I've laid out in the memo, uh, I've picked them out, and so they're all there in a chart in the memo. You can go back and look at them later. Uh, there's dozens of situations where the minister can, you know, just has leeway to decide. If the minister decides, that's what's gonna happen. Um, so it gives that flexibility to the minister. You can expect that sometimes those kinds of powers are delegated within the department. So it may be the minister personally, it may also be people within Indian Affairs. You know, people within ANSI, you know, are gonna have the leeway to, in their, in their great and wise judgment, to make various decisions about what's best for uh, your education systems and your children. It gives them that scope to choose without a predictable outcome. And if, of course, I don't think I need to tell anyone here how, uh, how problematic that is. So 
So those are the three primary ways that this act uh, increases federal control and um, in so doing decreases your control. I'll now just comment on a few other aspects of the act. Um, one is the Joint Council of Education Professionals. And um, that caught some attention because that of course wasn't in the uh, first draft version of this act that the federal government circulated in October. It is in the version that was introduced in Parliament, Bill C-33, that we're seeing now. So uh, this has been kind of touted as, I suppose, you know, now First Nations have control, I suppose, because of this uh, joint council. That's certainly not how I see it. This is, first of all, an advisory body. It, its only role in the Act is to provide advice. Um, the Act tells the Joint Council to provide advice to you, to First Nations and education authorities, your education authorities, um, which I suppose you may or may not accept. Um, the Act also tells uh, the Joint Council to uh, provide advice, or it tells the Minister that it must seek the advice of the Joint Council in a number of places. Pretty much all, not quite all, but certainly most um, of the times when, as I sorry, put it before, when the Minister has discretion, and you see that list of discretion, in almost all of those times, but not all, the minister is then required to seek the advice of the joint council. But the minister is not required to follow that advice. Uh, so there's a kind of, you know, the minister much, must consult the joint council, but the minister makes the decision. In all of those cases, the minister makes the decision. There's no case where any kind of decision making power is given to this joint council of education professionals. So in that sense, I don't see this joint council as decreasing federal control at all. Uh, it's, it's an advisory body, that's interesting, but, um, but that doesn't decrease the power that resides with the minister to make decisions under this act, and how the, that power has very, in a very real sense, decreased or would decrease your power. Uh, the other, you know, problematic uh, issue in, around the Joint Council is, of course, like, what is this Joint Council? Where would it come from? Um, it's not representing any of your particular nations. It's not something that you've set up, that you've said, this is a structure we want to establish, this is how we want to establish, this is who we want to appoint to it and the role it would have. It's something the ministers created, so uh, I don't see it as a First Nation body in that sense. Um, it would it would have members, uh, one to four members nominated by First Nation entities. So there would be some kind of nomination process in which some type, to type of First Nation body would be able to nominate members to it. Uh, you know, to me, uh, that does not make it a, a, a First Nation uh, governance kind of body by any means, right? You haven't set this up. It's not, you know, you haven't decided how you want to represent any of your nations. You haven't, you haven't decided that you would like a national body of education professionals at all, um, which you may or may not find useful. And then there's one or four members chosen by the minister. Um, so you don't know the proportion of the, of the members, like is it gonna be, you know, there could be five to nine overall. You don't know what the balance is gonna be. Uh, and of course, you don't know how many, uh, like who your First Nation reps are gonna be that are making these appointments. You can get a general sense. If there's a maximum of four nationally of First Nation nominees, that's obviously not gonna be every First Nation. That's not gonna be every nation or cultural or language group. That's not even gonna be every region. You know, so I don't, you know, it's gonna be some kind of large level uh, nomination. It does seem possible as well that if uh, that the that the federal government could, from among those nominated, make a final selection uh, and have have some selection power there. It's all a bit speculative at this point. Um, but just to return to that point, it, it's not you know there's it's a it's a bit of a bizarre cons construction. This idea you know it's been invented in Indian Affairs somewhere um, and it doesn't have any decision-making power in any case. Okay, the funding. 
Um, and I know uh, th uh, this will be a course of concern to all of you because underfunding has been so pervasive in First Nations education. I'm going to speak now about the funding provisions in the Act. Um, I'm going to return afterwards to the funding announcement that was made, because those things are a bit different. You know, the Act is, uh, if it were passed, would have a, on a longer shelf life, let's say, than a particular funding announcement that may come and go. Um, so I'm just going to focus on that separately, and then I'll come back. I was asked to just comment a bit about the funding announcement, and I'll do that at the end. Um, so the funding formula would be in the regulations, which haven't been developed yet, or have at least not released yet. So uh, we don't know exactly what it would look like, but what there is in the new version of the Act that's been introduced in Parliament is some sections that do set a, some high-level requirements about funding. And the key, um, there's two key provisions there, 43 and 45. 43 sets out some of these high-level requirements saying basically the funding formula will have to comply with these, legis with these kind of legislative standards. Because of course an act uh, supersedes the regulations, right? So it kind of goes down from the act to regulations to policy. Uh, one of the complaints in the October version that was released was, you know, there was supposed to be this statutory funding guarantee, we didn't see anything. Um, so then this, you know, the new version brings in a few comments about that. Section 43 is, you know, it looks not bad. There's certainly complaints I would have about some of the language there. Um, but, you know, if it were just on its own, I might say, well, that's a start. Um, the first part of it says that the funding must allow your service, your education programs and services to be comparable. Uh, to a similar sized provincial school in an analogous region, which it kind of defines, like a, a, a provincial school of a similar size in a similar region. So uh, that, that would be nice, right? Wouldn't it be nice for you to receive the kinds of uh, funding that a provincial school of a similar size to you in a similar region would receive? And you've done some analyses of that. You know, some First Nations have looked at those questions at various times and and those figures, you know, your funding would, certainly if that kind of standard were met, your funding would need to go up quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'll return to that topic, but, you know, that, that would be a good start. My own position, my own view is that you need more than comparable funding. Your students are starting from a very different position. They're at a serious disadvantage right now compared to provincial students. Uh, they're, you know, the Auditor General's found it would take 28 years for your students to catch up. At current rates of graduation stuff so there's a major catch-up situation that needs to happen and your students also are meeting and need to meet a different goal right they're they're bilingual many of them right and you need to promote and sustain your indigenous languages as well as your indigenous cultures and you need to raise children that as I mentioned earlier and this is your vision right your vision is to raise children that are strong in both worlds right and in both cultures that takes additional support and additional um, you know resources than a provincial school would need. And you have, of course, additional challenges in your communities. For example, you know, um, social and healing challenges, particularly due to the legacy of residential schools that affects children. There's a number of reasons why uh, I think you need quite a bit more resources than a comparable provincial school. Uh, but certainly you're not getting uh, comparable provincial school funding right now. You're getting much less than that. And so that would be an improvement. Uh, do I think that's enough? No. Would that be an improvement? Yeah. So you know that would be a start. It says you should get an amount to support First Nations language or culture. I mean that's good, but uh, an amount is not a very specific uh, phrase. So uh, certainly I couldn't say that that would guarantee you uh, anything you might need to meet your programming needs. It also says you should get an amount uh, to enable you to manage your school properties. Again, uh, that's good, but uh, an amount, I mean, I don't know. Uh, so there's that, you know, I think having some standards is a, a minimal improvement. But the real concern I have with the funding provisions is section 45, um, which 
then says, okay, yeah, we've said these things, but the total envelope is going to be whatever is going to max out at whatever the federal cabinet said in the federal budget. So, so that's it. So, you know, well, it looked like there was some degree of standards being set there, saying that, okay, the funding formulas and so on are going to need to comply with that. And, you know, that could have been a way to hold them to account at least to those standards. It was, could have been something. But if they're saying, well, it maxes out at whatever the budget, you know, whatever we budgeted, um, you know, that's set politically, right, year to year. Uh, it, it really takes away the benefit of having a legislative standard on funding if that can be, if you can over, if they can override that politically year to year. I mean, that's what they do now, right? They just set an amount. That's the amount. And they divide it up, they have a funding formula, and it's not enough. So it's not, uh, I don't think overall this is providing you with the funding guarantee to meet even the needs that are, even the standards that are set out there. I don't think those are sufficient standards. They're an improvement perhaps. But even those standards are not being guaranteed. The liability question is of course a big concern. There's two sections on liability, 46.1 and 46.2. Grinchy Peters made a point about liability that I would very much agree with. Uh, and so there's two things here. And the first one is, and Grinchy Peters mentioned this, you know, First Nations are very willing and uh, quite ready and able to, quite prepared to take responsibility for the things that you do, right? You understand that, you know, like we're all adults here. You understand that very well. You run your own education systems right now. You understand very well you have responsibilities when you do that. And to be quite frank, having that responsibility carries risks. You know, responsibility and risks carries liability. It's a fact, right? You know, if you make a big mistake in running your education system, it's possible that someone might uh, take legal action about that. That action would probably be against you, not the federal government, if it's something that you did, right? And that's, that's not... Uh, that's not necessarily a change from the status quo. Just to give a, like a small example there, you know, let's say someone in your school system, your director of education, just fired a teacher out of hand and you know, broke the law in doing so or did that for a discriminatory reason or so on. You know, that might bring a liability, right? And that legal process has to do with you and your, the way your system is running, your education system, it's not about the minister. You're quite prepared to say, yeah, we take responsibility for what we do. But it's the second part, uh, the second part of the liability, the 46.2, where Canada, so in 46.1, Canada says, federal government, we're not responsible for what the First Nations do. Okay, fine. 46.2, Canada says, and the stuff we do, we're not responsible for that either. So they said, 46.2 says, you know, if, if Canada fails to do something it was supposed to do, or it does something wrong in the way that it does it, it is still not liable unless it acted in bad faith. So it's not liable for anything it does in good faith. Uh, that's a very significant shield that Canada is giving itself against potential liability for the stuff that it does under this act. What does it do under the act? Well, it does a number of things. As you've seen, the minister gets a lot of power. There could be cases where you have complaints about the way the minister is exercising those powers, and it may be difficult to uh, bring legal action about the minister's exercise of those powers. And of course, the minister provides funding, right? That's the other thing the minister would now, it now, it does that already outside the act. That would now be something it's doing inside the act, and then it would have this shield from liability. Is it an absolute shield? No, I don't think it's an absolute shield. Um, there would be, I think, some types of uh, legal case that might still be brought. There might, you know, you might be able to bring what's called an application instead of an action. It gets a bit technical. I comment on that a little bit in the memo. Um, you know, you might be able to argue that they weren't acting in good faith. They were acting in bad faith. That's a very hard standard to meet. Uh, and so what's basically happening here is 
Canada is restricting the kinds of uh, legal proceedings that you could bring against it when it does not meet its responsibilities under the Act. Uh, and of course, that's a problem. There's a few parts of the Act that I just wanted to comment on that you know may sound nice, but don't really do anything for you. Uh, one is the preamble. It has, you know, there's some nice words. You know, you could have different opinions, of course, about the words in the preamble. It kind of talks on a bit. You know, there's some parts about that that I think sound nice. Um, but it, it's important to know that a preamble doesn't really have any force. A preamble is used to set some context. It can be used for interpretation. So, you know, if you were complaining about another section of the act, uh, you might look at the preamble for some context, try to interpret that section in light of the whole act, and it can help you do that. But on its own, you can't, you know, it can't, uh, it doesn't have any force on its own. It's not really a substantive section. There is a non-derogation clause, you know, this, this act is not, you know, not intent, shall not be interpreted so as to abrogate or derogate um, from your rights. Um, the, the main reason, I mean, this is not a great clause in a couple ways. One is that any kind of non-derogation clause is not, uh, doesn't recognize rights, that's not the purpose they serve. Uh, it just says, you know, uh, we're not trying to hurt, hurt your rights, and, you know, dear courts, please interpret it that way. The thing to know, though, is that the Constitution, like your rights are in the Constitution, right? This is talking about Section 35 rights. The Constitution, so I noticed before, I mentioned before, you know, you have an act below that regulation, below that policy. But above that, you would have con the Constitution. And the act is already, just without saying anything, it's already, as a matter of law, required to comply with the Constitution. So to put this kind of clause in an act, you're kind of just stating the obvious in that sense. Like, it doesn't really provide anything new. Sometimes non-derogation clauses are useful, and certainly in agreements, I think it's a different kind of question. It's worth looking at them, but in legislation, um, you know, I wouldn't uh, lose sleep over it because it's, it's, you know, that protection is in the Constitution. Um, the other thing is that this particular clause has some a bit tricky wording, which to me just seems designed to really minimize you know, minimize the suggestion that you might have rights that might be affected, you know, minimize uh, the, even the protection that this non-derogation clause could provide. And it's a weak, it's a weak non-derogation clause. So, uh, and just another reason why there's not, not really anything happening for you there. Okay, who will come? Up, who would come under this act if this act became law? Um, currently, all of you, right? So, pretty. I mean, I, I say that there may be some exceptions, but all First Nations with banned status who have a reserve, or I should say, who have residence on reserve, um, and so it would apply to any First Nation that um, has is a ban, recognized as a band under the Indian Act, and if you have a reserve. Uh, recognized under the Indian Act and you have residents on that reserve, uh, it's going to apply to you in respect to those residents. Um, as John mentioned earlier, if people who are under a self-government agreement will come out, and that's stated in the Act, um, it lists a couple specifically, but it doesn't you don't have to be specifically listed because it kind of says generally, if you're under a self-government agreement, you know, that's been recognized with federal legislation, you're going to come out. Um, so, you know, those First Nations that are under modern treaties that, you know, cover education, they're not going to come under this act. Um, those First Nations that have had a specific education self-government agreements developed, you know, the Mi'kmaq have done that in Nova Scotia, they're not going to come under this act. Um, BC is under a quite unique situation because they have that agreement but they've also been doing a lot of their stuff under a parallel track, and none of their First Nations have actually come into their jurisdiction agreement. It's a bit complicated, I won't go on about that, but the Act gives them three years to either come into their agreement or come under the Act. 
So they would have a three-year um, freeze, uh, three -year grace, three -year grace period in a sense. Um, but uh, those folks of you, you know, and those, you know, in the territories, they're not going to come under the act because they don't technically have reserves, right? That's not how, like, an NWT, UConn. But those folks of you in, the, you know, prairies, Ontario, you know, um, Quebec, south of the Cree area, and, you know, so on, you know, you're going to come under the act if it's passed. And the way out of it would be a self-government agreement. And I know a number of you have uh, negotiated and done work towards that. Um, some may be at a stage, I know Anishinaabeg Nation is at a stage of being, you know, quite close to, um, you know, considering whether to adopt one. Um, but uh, if you're not um, under such an agreement, then according to this act, if it did become law, then, then, uh, then you would be under the act. Okay, so that, that just reviews what I just said. I'll just skip that. There, the one thing I'll just add here is, um, this gets a bit complicated, but as I mentioned, so if you are, if you have band status, if you have residents on reserves, you're not under a self-government agreement, the act applies to you. And at that point, it's worth thinking, and what I would suggest, you know, were this act to become law, of course, if it doesn't, it, that's excellent. Um, but if, it, if, it, if it's heading in the direction of it is, then I would suggest you might want to look at getting advice about how that might affect your First Nation, or if there's a group that you're involved with in education, involved with in education, how that might affect you know you and your neighbors, um, because everyone's situation is a little bit different. If you have a school on reserve, then pretty much everything in the Act would apply to you. If you don't have a school on reserve, it would still apply to you. Uh, for example, there will be new rules about tuition agreements, and those would apply to everyone. Um, it seems to me it would apply to private schools, uh, and no matter who's running your school, you know, whether it's you, whether it's a private school, whether it's a local authority, some regional authority, you know, however you've organized it, it seems to me this would apply. The one exception is the, the federal school which it's not really an exception, it would still come under the act, but the minister would maintain the responsibilities. So just summing up and just coming back to the, you know, going from the little picture there back to the big picture, um, it is really about direction. And uh, you know, that status quo area that you're in is in this middle zone. You know, are you gonna move in the direction of this act, which takes you towards federal control and 9124, or in the direction of your control, looking at negotiated agreements, treaty renewal, and your own Section 35 laws. Um, and I think that is really the question of, of direction. I, you know, our, our legal opinion is that this act takes you in the backwards direction, not the forwards direction. Um, and uh, you know we've explored that a bit with the context and also looking uh, a bit at the specific details. So I think that's it, but I'll just speak um, briefly about the funding announcement. Yeah, would you like, would you prefer to do that later, Frenchie? Absolutely, we could, I'm yours.